Welcome to you all. We have um, fantastic speakers, but we also have a fantastic audience. Many of you could have been sitting on this t t side of the table. And we look forward to, um, to your interventions, uh, disruptions, disagreements um, along the course of the morning. Um, I'm not going to delay things. We're just going to kick off with this first panel. Uh, we're tremendously lucky uh, to have three fantastic speakers um, here. So I don't think they probably need to be introduced to you, but just in case, uh, it is Monday. So um, welcome to Ed Guiney, to Alan Clark, and to Willie White. Um, uh, Dennis and I are going to um, do a Q&A with them, and then we're going to open up to um, questions from the floor. And the, and the theme, obviously, is um, uh, uh, careers in the creative industries. We've focused, for the sake of, uh, of time, on theatre, film, and TV, um, but we could have we could have encompassed uh, many other um, disciplines. So we'll, we'll pick up three experts in the field. We have um, some questions we're going to ask them. And um, as I say, uh, you're very welcome then to join in. We'll, have, um, we'll go straight from this to Katrina Noonan, our keynote speaker, and then we'll have a coffee break. There is coffee outside. If you, if you didn't get any, you're welcome to slip out. Yes. OK, so should we get going? just to warm things up, and it's a kind of question 1A and B. So I was going to ask you all to tell us how you started your careers, and looking back, um, would you have done anything differently? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll start with uh, Ed. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, well, I actually started, I sort of started my career here in Trinity, because uh, I was a student here in the late 80s, and um, I had been friends in school with, uh, well, we hadn't gone to the same school, but I was sort of friends with Lenny Abrahamson from my school days. In fact, I dated his sister when I was about 14, which was <laughs> for three weeks, which is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, were, we used to meet at parties and we, were, we talked about films, and then we both ended up here in Trinity. And uh, I had a notion to set up a film production society in Trinity. Um, and at that time, I don't know if it still exists, there was obviously there was a kind of, it's actually, of course it's Freshers Week here, but, uh, but there was, you know, the, whatever you get as a society, but also there was a, um, a kind of a provost fund for the Vision Performing Arts, which was the interest on a film called Educating Rita, the shot in Trinity. And so we, we got funding through those two things. Uh, Lenny and I set up the society with, with other friends and um, made some very bad films about the Trinity Bowl uh, and other things. Um, and, uh, but that, that was really how I started, actually. And then at the same time, I, I started working uh, in the kind of proper industry with, um, with two now very good friends of mine, um, David Collins and John Callagher, who had a company back in those days called Strong Bug Green Apple. And I started working for them just as a kind of runner, basically. So that's how I started. Okay, thank you. Do you want to answer part two? Would I have done it differently? <laughs> uh, actually, not really. You know, I mean, I mean, for what I do, I'm a producer, and what's been really important to me um, is is sort of having, uh, like Lenny, you know, is one of my closest friends, but also, and, and this is quite a common thing, I think, maybe in film and theatre, and I don't know if the others can comment on it, but we were. We, I suppose, sort of, and Andrew Lowe, who's my partner, and I, my business partner, he was in Trinity at the same time. Although we didn't spend a lot of time with each other, I, I knew him from back then. Um, and you kind of form a cohort, you know, you form kind of friendships that, um, that really endure. And actually, that's quite common. You, you can see that in, you know, other groups of people who work, certainly work in the film industry. Um, but I guess also if you look at sort of a slightly older generation than ours, it was kind of... Paul McGuinness, James Morris, that gang, you know, who were involved in television and film and music, obviously. So, uh, so I found that, you know, very important. And Lenny, you know, we're, right now we're shooting um, Sally Rooney's uh, book, Normal People, here in Trinity, which Lenny is directing, you know, whatever X number of horrible years later. So it's been a very important thing. And actually, I think I would, certainly for what I do, but I think generally, to find your kind of fellow travelers, to find your group of people who you share kind of interest with and who you can kind of share the, the stresses and pains and the joys uh, over time is a, is a really important thing. 
So, Anne, would you like to answer that question then, Anne? How you got started in the business? Sure. Um, so, it, it's a very long time ago now. Um, so, I studied, um, and I did an arts degree in European studies in UCC and fully thought I'd be going off to Brussels. Uh, uh, and then didn't, ran away and joined the circus instead. Um, fell in love with the theatre basically. Um, so my final, as a, as a present to myself after my finals, I came to Dublin um, and sort of saw 13 shows in the Dublin Theatre Festival actually <laughs> in the course of a week and thought, you know, this is where I need to be. And then thought, you know, how on earth am I qualified to work in the theatre? I, I don't, you know, I haven't got any sort of real sort of skills. So I went and did this extraordinary thing, that sounds like antique to say it, but I did a, a secretarial course in the Irish Times training for about eight weeks. And then I was lucky enough to get a job in the Dublin Theatre Festival, where I stayed for a year. So that was my first job out of college, and then I went to the Gate Theatre and stayed there for a very long time. Okay. And uh, what you Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I mean, the, the, I think the... The landscape was very different then to, the, to, to what it is now. There were far fewer opportunities. Uh, there was much less diversity in terms of theatre production. Um, but one, one thing I, I do wish I'd had more experience of over the years was, was sort of a hands-on sort of experience of being in the rehearsal room with a number of different directors, seeing how productions are put together. So that's something I've had to do sort of retrospectively, um, and I get to do it a lot more now as a producer and as a sort of relatively senior producer. Um, and it's one of the great joys of, of the work that I do is to be able to spend time seeing how shows come together in very different kinds of productions in the hands of different directors. Thank you. Well, I suppose at the point of starting my career, I didn't know it was a career. I had uh, <laughs> been given, my, it's my belief, bad advice by my career guidance teacher. I was involved in school plays and the like in secondary school, but somehow I ended up studying science at UCD for a year, which of course I failed. But I was on my way to the first of my lectures, and I didn't go to many more after that, in the science block, and I bumped into the sister of a friend of mine who told me I'd never heard of drama stock in UCD, who told me that there were auditions on the freshest play. So I went down and got a job as, a, I think, a fork carrier rather than a spear carrier. And that's basically where I spent the next seven years. I got an unremarkable undergraduate degree, kind of disguised that a little bit with the Masters in UCD subsequently, and then started a fringe theatre company with my friends in the mid-90s. So if I were to do something differently, I would rather there was a less kind of a circuitous route, and I could actually be told that there was a drama course in Trinity, for example, that I might have studied on. Um, I, I, before the internet, so we were somewhat reliant on mediators to give me this information. And perhaps, yeah, I would have advanced more quickly in my career, but I mean, it's, just, it's the same as, as many people. You, you, you start it up yourself. And then if you're successful or people you work with do good work, then you come to people's notice and you get other opportunities. I mean, I agree with Ed to a certain extent that it's good to have a cohort, but one of the lucky things for me is because I worked at Dublin Youth Theatre and I worked at Project Arts Centre, as well as having people who are my peers like Annie over there and Jason Byrne and Jimmy Faye, I also work with people who are much younger than me. And I, for me, certainly, it's important to remain open to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, that's really interesting. Actually, a lot of those, uh, those responses actually resonate quite a lot with some of the results we'll be discussing later. So it's great to actually yeah. to see that so early. So, uh, so, so moving on, this is maybe starting to go into a more, more technical question for Ed, but it you know, relates to funding, which we're quite concerned about. So, you know, as, as one of the major kind of focuses of, of, of the research. So, Ed, in order to qualify for Section 481, Film tax credit production companies are obliged to engage a certain number of trainees in every production. I just wonder if you could explain to us a little bit about how that uh, operates and how you'd say it's working out in practice. Um, well, there's, there's always been a, uh, a requirement to have trainees uh, on film production, television production. Um, the rules changed a little bit this year, and actually, Fran Brown. Screen Ireland is here, who sort of probably knows it much better than I. But um, but ba basically, earlier this year, the department um, required the Department of Arts required that uh, productions uh, submit a kind of skills training plan, twenty one days in advance of applying for Section Four A One. I'm right in saying, mm -hmm. um, which outlines the kind of the skills training uh, um, practices and, and what you commit to on a, on a film or TV drama. Um, and it comes from a really good place. Uh, I think everybody, absolutely everybody, 
um, is aligned uh, in the need to provide kind of vocational training on the job training. Um, crew are very open to it. Production companies are very open to it. Uh, Screen Ireland, the department are all very open to it. Uh, the, the slight catch with it is that it sort of, um, it was landed on us collectively, I think, uh, in April of this year without much clarity. Um, so that it sort of feels to us in the industry that it's a little bit more of a PR exercise or a box ticking exercise uh, than something that's been properly thought through with proper priorities and requirements and very little, you know, thought around diversity, you know, in, in, in all its sort of uh, various manifestations. Um, and certainly for productions, it kind of feels like there's a lot of paperwork uh, to fill out. Um, and the kind of onus on, for instance, you know, it, it's sort of more senior people on on productions are, are mandated to train junior people, but they've no training in how to train. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no kind of so, uh, you know, they 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 just they have, they have no sort of background in that. So, it, I think there's a real desire for it to work. I think everybody wants it to work, um, and I think that um, we will figure it out. Uh, but it's sort of not quite as it should be right now, I would say. But um, its heart is in the right place, I would say. I think that's fair, Fran. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, what about then theatre? Is there an equivalent programme in theatre? How, do, you know, how does it work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there isn't. The short answer is there isn't. There's, there is very little training for theatre full stop. Um, yeah. And there's very little funding for training as a result. Um, and the Lure, obviously, even runs you know courses for actors and stage management and technical theatre, and it has a couple of MFA programmes as well. And they have a couple of bursary programmes for, for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford the fees. But the numbers are tiny. Mm. Um, the Arts Council has a travel and training award, which, um, again, it's, 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 it's for established professional practitioners. And again, the numbers, the, the money, it's sort of the, the maximum award payable is 1,500 euro. So, <laughs> so, so that's where we are. And in practice, people generally sort of learn on the job. Um, it's all very informal. There is, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, they make it up as they go along. And would you like it to be otherwise? I think there, what's really interesting this morning, actually, even just talking to a couple of people, is just the complete difference in, in, in sort of the, the funding structure and environment between film and theatre. And I think certainly film, I think, is regarded more as a business. And theatre, in terms of the Arts Council, at any rate, is something that must be supported from the public purse. And I think that really has an effect in the sort of programmes that are available and the sort of funding that's available. Um, so I think that's... That's really interesting, yeah. 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 And, and I absolutely think, uh, you know, people do follow the money, you know, and in the way that, you know, now people really have to engage with this new programme of... of, of uh, whatever, what's it called, the, what you just talked about, the... Um, screen skill. Yeah, 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 and taking on trainees as yeah. part of productions, you know, so that will, will now happen. Um, so I think, uh, I think there is absolute scope there for, uh, but I think the, the arts council is our primary funder. Yeah, do you want to come in on that one? Sure thing, I mean, I think no matter how much training, formal training, vocational training you do, there still will always have to be an element of learning on the job, for sure. But I, nonetheless, and despite the advent of courses like the Learners, there's still a great degree of kind of ad hoc or improvisation to learning how to practice theatre in Ireland. If we zoom out a bit, though, we should take into account, I mean, film participates in two economies, the free market and the subsidy market, but we're substantially um, uh, in the kind of subsidised uh, sector in theatre. But the, and we have some economists in the audience, the Ireland ranks at the very bottom of Europe in terms of percentage of GDP expenditure on culture. It does include religion, but more or less it's still a true fact. Um, and uh, it's because historically we haven't been a wealthy country. And, and the... Uh, we, when you start trying to support a theatre producing and presenting infrastructure and the training of people and the development of work, that actually costs a lot more money than the government currently um, affords to the Arts Council, which is for most of us the primary funder. When Olive Braden was here at the council in the mid noughties they were chasing a figure of 100 million by the end of the term of that council. They got as far as I think it's 86 and then there was a huge cut um, at the time of the crash and the funding for the Arts Council still has not recovered to that point, which was not itself as a peak. 
So that's that's a real problem. It, 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 you follow the money, but if, uh, if there should, could be more money to follow, is my point. Mm -hmm. And on Taoiseach, committed to double spending on the arts, not necessarily by the Arts Council during the life of this government. And uh, it's a very slowly increasing gradient so far. <laughs> That's tactfully put, thank you. And, and just a, a question for you, Willie. I mean, what part does the theatre festival play? I mean, is it, a, is it an opportunity to showcase new talent, to incubate new talent? Is that a way in for you know, emerging companies, or is that more the fringe? You know, how do you see the theatre festival playing a part in, in I mean, the We're part of an ecology. I guess for your first outing, directly out of college in your early days as a independent practitioner company, perhaps the Fringe or Project Arts Centre, if you're in Dublin anyway, would be the place that you first show your work. After a period of time and after discussions, etc., there may be a moment where it's appropriate to present in the festival. The festival has to do two things. It's both a showcase for Irish work, but it's also really important in the context of very little international work being seen in Ireland year-round, except for the Fringe and the Dance Festival, notwithstanding Wicked, which I wouldn't include by any board gosh. So it's really important that the festival is a portal into international theatre practice. It's very challenging with our level of funding to present much more than we do. And if anybody's reading the Irish Times on Saturday, myself and Ruth McGowan and others are talking about how there's a real dearth of physical infrastructure in Dublin for performing arts in general, theatre, dance, uh, music, and just you know, subculture as well. So that's a real challenge. Not enough money, not enough spaces. So we try to do the best we can with the resources that we're afforded uh, in order to try, I mean, our job is to try and increase the conversation, move the conversation forward about what theatre looks like now. Okay, okay that, thank you very much, really. And then to move to a different uh, uh, kind of focus, I suppose. But I mean, we talked about slightly about barriers to entry in terms of training that uh, Ed mentioned. But just to ask everyone in general, I mean, would you, what would you consider to be the main barriers to entry to your respective sectors? in terms of gender, class, or ethnicity. Starting maybe with <laughs> there are multiple barriers. If we're talking about a situation where you have to self-exploit in the first place, then you need to be able to afford to do that. Even where people are uh, offering internships, who can afford to take up an unpaid or a lowly paid position? So that's a real consideration. I mean, the Arts Council is currently asking us. Um, we've been, many of us are, have our application due on. Um, 5.30 on Thursday, what we're doing to reflect Ireland now. So if you look at the fact that, let's say, in the last 20 years, Ireland has changed considerably, 60% of our population are non-Irish, the question is, what are the barriers to entry for those people if they might want to be involved in film or theatre? There's an interesting report published by the ESRI, I think it was on the occasion of its 50th anniversary, where there's a very low rate of progression for children and migrants in, into the secondary system, into culture, reason being a lot of time because their parents aren't speakers, are native speakers of English which could be a barrier for them participating. So there, for example, so all, all the barriers that you would expect. Obviously, there's been a conversation running in the past four years, uh, certainly amongst theatre and rippling through other sectors about gender equality. That's one thing that we've taken on board, but there are many more things that need to be issues that need to be addressed, people that need to be supported to participate, if we think that's an important thing, which I do in, in the culture that, we, that we're involved in. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, just on the whole gender equality thing, I think you have to hear probably remember as it's so three, three short years ago since the Abbey announced its centenary <coughs> program called Waking the Nation. Uh, and in that program, there were, um, I think, 18 lead artists over the course of an entire year, of whom 16 were men. Uh, and it was the shocking thing really was that it happened that nobody had seen it coming. Uh, and that sparked an incredible um, response uh, from uh, uh, an ad hoc group of people who came together and under the umbrella Waking the Feminists and in the course of the year achieved extraordinary change um, in terms of putting gender equality really firmly on the table in the theatre sector. Um, the Abbey committed to achieving gender equality in its programming over five years, so between 2017 and 2022, um, all the major theatre organisations have signed up to gender equality policies. So it's it's been, it may not, it, have been a sort of barrier to entry, but it certainly was a barrier to advancement, and I think that's certainly been addressed in the theatre sector, and that's we're not going back. And um, in terms of the other, in terms of class and diversity, I think absolutely the hidden subsidy in the theatre is just is massive, and it's um, yeah. every, every single person working at every level in the business subsidises their art. Um, whether they're artists or or, or producers or or technicians. Um, and unless you can afford to do that, you, it's really, really hard to sustain a career um, as you, you know, people grow older and want to have, you know, things that people would take, you know, expect as, a, you know, to, you know, to have children, to have, you know, somewhere to live. 
it's just really hard to sustain. So it's at the moment, I think, really a, a quite an in, unequal business. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely echo that, really. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's very similar in, in the film industry. I mean, most people have had, most people who come into the industry have had the benefit of third level education, which obviously in itself, um, you know, indicates that in terms of class and opportunity that there's a, you know, a particular kind of filter going on. Um, I mean, one, you know, a, again, a bit like probably the Waking the Feminists, that the, in the sort of, alongside that and the kind of whole Harvey Weinstein thing and I mean, there has been a big change in in the in um, the representation of women in film, um, and the film board. Or, oh, sorry, Screen Ireland, the former TV director James Hickey's here, but Screen Ireland were quite front-footed about that in terms of implementing policies to encourage more gender diversity, and I think quite successfully have done so. And what what was interesting about that, from just from a purely personal point of view, um, is that. The, that the that the asking of the question collectively, in, you know, in, in the world at that time, made us made us less lazy about that actually, and I think has made the industry less lazy about that. So that now, when you have uh, a, a project in development uh, that may feel like that it's more I don't know, female skewed, if the writer is female or whatever, you 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 start running lists of female filmmakers. Certainly in the first instance, it doesn't always mean that you end up there, but there's. And, and so, so we've had a big kind of behavioural change in that regard internally, and, and just purely anecdotally, we've made two films this year, both directed by women, and then Normal People is directed by Lenny and Hetty McDonald. So, it's, so, you, so that's really happening, and I think what's encouraging about that is that if we if we were as open to being nudged in that direction in terms of true diversity, in terms of bringing people who are new to Ireland, new citizens of Ireland, into our industry, um, and in, in terms of class um, inclusion, I think we could do it, but it needs it, it needs a bit of nudging, and I, but I think there's an openness to it. I think probably it's more complicated with that in a way, because um, you know there may be people who haven't even thought about a career in the arts or in film or in television, so you, you probably need to start much younger and, and suggest to people that there may be possibilities in, in, in our world for them from a much earlier age. Um, but, but, you know, the onus is on us to be part of that, obviously, um, but, but it's a, a conversation that is certainly worth having and I think could have good impact. And I think, you know, what, what certainly you see in the film industry, largely in television, is that um, like, there's also, and I, I don't in no way mean to sound uh, sort of cynical about this, but like there is also a kind of an economic advantage to inclusion and diversity because the work becomes richer, which means that you speak to audiences that you haven't spoken to before, and you actually see that you're beginning to see that that, that actually, you know, audiences who may not have been directly served by material are actually eating it up and. So, so there's a really so in terms of regenerating what we do, in terms of the future of what we will do, bringing new voices, new cultures into 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 the creation of the work is absolutely key. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a part two to this question, which is sustaining a career. So, you know, one thing is entering the business, and that would be you know tend to be I, I rather guess younger people, but obviously as you were mentioning, you still have to live, mm -hmm. get a mortgage. Um, possibly, you know, and, and, and get health insurance or all these things. So you can't always be living... Okay, <laughs> that was funny. Um, uh, so you can't always be living on, on you know, a, a tiny, tiny amount of, of, of income that's irregular. Is there anything, you know, is there anything we can do to change this? Anything you'd like to comment on this? Three viewers are just so self-evident that... There's a difference, certainly, if you look at theatre between myself and Anne. Anne is a very, she's the best producer in Ireland. She's very entrepreneurial. She is constantly having to generate work and projects. So that's how she makes her living as a producer. I'm fortunate in that since 2002, I've had a full -time, one or other full-time jobs in the arts. And I suppose the responsibility that comes with that is then to try and generate opportunities, not necessarily for Anne, she's self-sufficient, but for artists who are working from project to project. And that has certainly been the story of funding for theatre in recent years. When I started out, people would form companies, there would be a degree of stability, and they would produce a number of works during the year. With the crash, 
there was a kind of a rationalization of that. So most artists are self-exploited right in application. And if they're study, uh, subsidized, if they're successful, barely covered to make the project, let alone the work that's gone into conceiving and developing it. Mm -hmm. So I think the responsibility of the establishment of those in somewhat permanent employment is to try and generate opportunities for others. Um, yeah, thanks, Willie, for those lovely words. I have to say, it, so it's, no, well, yeah, it is and it isn't in that um, Landmark also operates from project to project, so each project has to be self-sustaining. Um, they're good things because it drives up the, 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 sort of the volume of work apart from anything else. Um, but, um, I was going to say about that. Yeah, it's just, it, I think even for people who on the face of it, you know, have extremely successful careers, I think it is still really precarious to work in the theatre. Um, Louise Lowe, who is one of our most brilliant and talented theatre makers and runs a company called Anu, who do extraordinary work, um, like really, really world-class, unique work, uh, went to, uh, with um, the National Campaign for the Arts, I think, recently, to, 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 uh, um, to the goal to argue for increased funding, and said that she is two months away from being, you know, being homeless. You know, it's like we're not supporting our artists, and there are all sorts of, um, there, you know, whenever, you know, sort of companies go abroad, you know, you see, you know, the minister, and actually Pat Kinnavan, who did so brilliantly in Edinburgh uh, last month, um, you know, the minister announced more funding, or, or the latest round of funding round, um, it's all very well to, to, to you know, for, for artists to go abroad and fly the flag, but they need to be supported here at home. Yeah, the, just to intervene, Martin Shanahan hosted an event for us in Accenture there in May where he interviewed Gary Hines about her career in theatre. And Martin spoke about the tragedy of the commons, which is what Anne is referring to. Like, arts in Ireland are, are a commons that anybody can avail of, but no, nobody really wants to pay for it. Certainly, they aren't paid as much as is required to have a properly supported while well functioning. Kosher. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Um, I'm I mean, it's like it is different in the film and television industry, I think, um, in that once you sort of, you know, work your way up from a traineeship and become, I don't know, a director of photography or a designer or whatever, you can get very well paid. And it's a freelance, you know, it's a freelance thing, which obviously is, um, you know, can, can be difficult. But, but by and large, you know, people do, do quite well. Uh, I think where, um, and, and also just because of 481 and because of the kind of boom in audiovisual production internationally, all the stuff you know about, that, that it is very busy here. Where, where I think uh, you sense it most um, is, I guess, among creators, and what I mean by that are people who are trying to become film directors or writers for film. I think that, um, that they, they experience a lot of the same kind of challenges as um, as writers and directors in, in other forms, I think. It's uh, particularly starting off. But even once you've started off and you've made a film, um, you know, very often you get paid very little and then it can take you two or three years to make another film. So so it's sort of, uh, it's there's, there's real difficulty around that, I would say. Um, although there are huge opportunities, so I don't want to sound, I think it, it is of a different order maybe than drama, I think, is, you know, Sorry, theatre, I should say. Um, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. And uh, just so we'll open it up to, the, the, to everybody in, in a couple of minutes, but just one final question to ask everybody. Uh, you know, what do you see, moving on from that, what do you see as being the future in your sectors for careers? And are you optimistic? Certain you, will you? Well, I am an optimist, <laughs> so I, therefore I'll be optimistic. I think if we can succeed in making the argument about the type of investment and the type of uh, capital development that will be required, I think we actually have the talent, and there is actually the appetite for, call it what you like, live entertainment. We know that there's a premium in the city centre on space for retail, but retail is moving away from bricks and mortar, and my question, I was just looking at the hammers at Dublin Chamber last Friday morning, looking at um, Hammerson's project for developing the North Part of O'Connell Street. They're looking at the Carlton and they're thinking of it in terms of the cinema. It's good cinema provision already. But my question is, uh, you know, you used to have uh, people 
going and doing things on a common street instead of queuing for buses. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested to know how this is included. So I mean, I am optimistic. The talent is there. There are constraints uh, because of physical infrastructure and because of money. But I think if those constraints are dealt with, I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe, we look at something like the Board Gosh Energy Theatre, which never existed before, which is here for seven years, has 2,200 seats, and it's full almost year-round with uh, touring, a lot of the time, West End musicals, whatever. But, uh, and the Gaiety and the Olympia are still functioning. The ecology has changed somewhat, but who knew there was that capacity there? Mm -hmm. So I'd love if there was something like a board gosh in O'Connell Street on the Carlton site, instead of as is mooted a boutique cinema or perhaps a gambling emporium. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd love if there were a 500 seat theatre. Which is a real gap in arts provision. Good, good, good. Um, so just in terms of the, the sort of the question about being optimistic, I think you know if you're a theatre producer, optimism is, is part of your DNA. You know, it is a sort of ridiculously optimistic thing to think. You know, I'll put on a play and people will come to see it and pay money and go home happy. Um, in terms of you know sort of building a career and sustaining a career, and I know what I just said about it being very precarious, but all I can say is that on a personal level, I have two daughters. One of them is currently working in the literary department at the Travers in Edinburgh, which is Scotland's new writing theatre. The other one I thought was going to be a lawyer, but sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> She's studying creative writing in NUID. Uh, but the, the, the real thing is, 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 is that actually I'm really happy about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't wish they were doing anything else, because I know that if they can find a way to make a career, that will sustain them and they will be happy. And that's all anybody wants for their children. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I echo that optimism generally. I mean, I, I, I think this, uh, one of the things that um, is important when we look at the future of the film and television industry here, I think, I mean, very briefly, the industry is sort of split into two parts in one sense. One is the kind of offshore industry, and the other is the indigenous industry. And what I mean by the offshore industry is large productions, say like large Netflix productions coming into Ireland, which we effectively service. So there wouldn't be Irish creative involvement in those Irish writers or directors or producers. And then the indigenous industry, which are people who actually create work here, uh, which they make and hopefully exploit internationally. And I think um, the balance of that we've got to be very careful about. I, I, I worry that sometimes that the focus can be more on the offshore industry because that provides you with the headlines around Star Wars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and I think that the real prize is to develop our indigenous industry, in other words, to develop Irish writers, Irish uh, directors, Irish storytelling. And I use Irish in the broadest sense possible um, in all its inclusiveness in the way that we've discussed here earlier. And I would like to see more of a focus. Uh, I think in a way writing is, is, is the key as with all of you know, what we do. And I'd like to see more of a focus on creating a culture of excellence around Irish screenwriting because I think that's the thing that you sort of can take, that's what everyone wants in, in my business at least, is great writing. That's sort of the key thing. And, and if you can take that out into the world, then I think you can create something really special. So I think I'm very optimistic, but I think there's a big prize. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to think how to nab that prize. It's a, it's a kind of world-class prize. Um, so that, that's my comment. Great. Can we um, open to the top, Jane? Yeah, brilliant. We have a roving mic. Um, uh, and so, would you mind just introducing yourself very briefly? Um, and uh, can I just ask you to, I know many of you will want to make statements. If you want to make a statement, it would help if it ended with a question mark. Um, and it would also help if it was reasonably concise. Um, and um, anybody like to intervene? Any, any hands? Uh, can I up get one there at the back? And, and... Uh, hi, I'm Gary. I'm a former student of Brutes. Um, so I, my question is, uh, with the threat of an audio Brexit seeming inevitable at this stage, um, do you see it, how do you see it affecting your industry and is it all doom and gloom or do you think there's any opportunities in there? It will affect it. Well, if, if there's a, a, a negative budget post Brexit or if the budget is delayed, then I don't see us um, increasing Arts Council funding. For us in terms of presenting international work, Britain is obviously between Ireland and the continent, so there's going to be a surcharge in time or money or both in terms of getting people from there to here and also um, it might affect what so we won't be perhaps buying as much work from the UK so depending on what the sterling rate is as well. So more treasury, more time, more money, less, less budget. 
Um, well, we have an office in London and in Belfast, so we sort of operate very much across both territories. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a worry for sure. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, the immediate worry for us is around foreign exchange, actually, just the value of mm -hmm. sterling, because a lot of what we do is funded in sterling, so that's, uh, that has a big impact. Um, but ultimately, I think the um, I think the Britain will suffer more than I mean we're very much part of the whole kind of European thing, which there are great advantages for. And so, in a weird way, taking the UK out of Europe leaves us as the only English language production com country in Europe. And there's certainly an opportunity around that, I would say. Um, so I don't know. I think there are both opportunities and threats. That's for that. Thank you. Hi there, Katrina Newman from Cardiff University. Um, I suppose going back to the question of diversity, I'm wondering how does the diversity of the audience, of the consumption, map onto the diversity of the sector? Can you see a connection between the two, or how do you see one informing the other or remedying the other? Any of It's a hard thing, thing to measure, um, because we, I suppose we really only currently do so um, anecdotally, and we do survey people at the festival but we don't have a question for their ethnicity, as far as I'm aware at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it is the case that in the same way that lack of, for want of a better word, lack of participation mm -hmm. rather integration is visible in, in the people making the work, to an extent it's also the case. But for example, we have a work in Portuguese. So I met somebody last, um, in, well, two works actually uh, in Portuguese. Um, so I met a Brazilian guy last week to try and help to target, literally not Portuguese, but try and target the community. So for me, success when you bring international work is having at least two audiences there. The language audience for a place of origin mm -hmm. as well as your own domestic audience, whatever their ethnicity is. And that's what I love about theatre being a meeting place. But I would say the monitoring is at a very crude level at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I think if you go into any theatre auditorium, yeah, certainly in Ireland, mostly in, in London, you know, even in New York, your audience is made up largely of middle-aged white people. Um, and I had a very different experience recently. I went to see a show called Nine Night in the West End in London, which is a show that started in the National Theatre and transferred. And most of the audience there were, were people of colour. And it was a really strange experience to sit, you know, and to feel the person who was, was, was not represented on stage for once. Um, and, and, and I think it, what, it, what it absolutely proved is that if, you, if people can see their stories on stage, there is an audience there and it will go. So I think the art has to lead and the audiences will follow. Um, I don't have much to add really. I mean, obviously it's, it's sort of, with television it's very hard to know who's watching anything. Um, and we don't really survey too much in the cinemas, but I think what Anne said is completely right, I think, if you build it, they will come, I think. Will they though? I think so, yeah, I do. I do, do think so. Do we not create spaces yeah. that can be exclusionary in some ways? Say that again. Do we not create spaces, physical spaces, that can sometimes be excluded? Sorry. Do we not cre create spaces? And here I'm talking about serving from the UK perspective. You know, how many people are going into theatres, going into museums, into galleries, consuming the kind of culture that we're producing? I, I think that's true, and I, I guess the... the, the but if they're not seeing uh, work that sort of speaks to them or speaks to their experience, it certainly there's no interest in getting in there. And I guess there's two things then to look at. One is the work and the other is making the places as welcoming as possible. And um, I mean, we run a venue at Cinema in Dublin, the Lighthouse, and one in Galway called Plus, and we try as much as we can to make them feel like community um, cinemas. That's not to say that everyone regards them as such. We may want them to feel like that, doesn't mean that. Um, but but we we try, you know, we try, and we have skills programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I'm, I'm sure we could be doing a lot more. But I think, I guess, on a venue by, by venue basis, it's in their interest to encourage new audiences, audiences as well. I guess. Just if I can come in on that. Um, you, it's not an excuse, but it's a fact. Um, Ireland was basically a monocultural country. Uh, until 20 years ago, when we first started seeing um, large immigration from Sub-Saharan Africa, and then with EU accession, we were enriched further. I often think that the arts are, are given an unusually hard task, which is they have to deal with people who graduated at 18 with very little exposure to arts and culture, and, and basically uh, having been immersed in a, an oxidocentric dominant culture, which is what's represented in our museums. It's not their story. 
generally. And then we're, we're asked, oh, what are you doing about um, diversity? So I think it has to be, I mean, the, the biggest investment by the state in forming citizens or the people living in the country is in the education system. I have two children in secondary school, and when I look at the curriculum, for example, for English, it's incredibly conservative because it's teachable, and to change it is too much of a wrench. So if we want to change the outcomes, then we have to change the processes that produce them. And of course, um, culture in receipt of public money is accountable, but can't bear the sole burden of that. Somebody else want to come in while you have a Glenn Kaufman, I'm a freelance filmmaker. Um, it seems like a lot of our, we talked a little bit about equ equity efforts and things like that. It seems like a lot of our, our public efforts at equity and at growing the arts come from a sort of a top down approach. I remember about a year ago, um, Screen Ireland, or I think that might have been the called the Irish Film Board, um, published a thing about wanting to improve ec gender equity in the film sector. And I was a little concerned that at least the public face of it only spoke about efforts for directors, writers, and actors. And it struck me that we there wasn't much, didn't seem to be a well articulated plan for the rest of what we call the industry. I was like, where's marketing, where's post production, where's distribution and exhibition? You know, what are we calling the industry? I wonder if you can talk about the need for and benefits of sort of a larger definition of what is considered the industry. Um, I think that um, in large parts of the industry, other jobs in the industry, there is quite a lot of gender equity, just as it turns out there are quite a lot of female producers, for instance. Um, I, I, I'm, where I think it, where I think it sort of, in, in, in the film industry again, where it sort of raises its head, I think, is around the jobs that are traditionally seen as, as male jobs, like, for instance, director of photography is generally being a male job. Um, but that's changing. I mean, that's absolutely changing. I mean, on normal people, we had two female DOPs, two Irish female DOPs. So I think it's about role models, and I also think that female filmmakers, um, like we, we just worked with a filmmaker called Phila Lloyd, and she insisted that 50% of her heads of department were female. So, so I'm not saying that there isn't more work to be done. There certainly is, and again, you know, Fran or James may know more about the detail of what's contemplated. But, um, but by I suppose changing the kind of power structure, in other words, the people in charge and the people in charge of hiring are of a different gender. I think that actually has a kind of a, mm -hmm. an, a, a very visible impact on the people who are hired. But there are still there's still work to be done for sure. Francis Joanne, um, wearing my economist hat as opposed to the Abbey Theatre hat. What's very interesting to me is that this one very large group of people who move between the worlds in which you operate, which are mainly the actors. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, that has evolved, I think, as the film industry has come along, as television things have developed, it's given wider opportunity, and I'm very struck by the extent to which people move between and across the sectors. And I'm wondering if there's anything in the way the wider sector operates that could make that transition easier that could make that work, whether that links back into the tax system or works into the way you know, differential incomes in different years are affected. Um, I'm just wondering, has that been something that you've thought about or experienced? Um, I think it is It is very porous. Um, um, so for example, <laughs> it's funny to hear Philip Deloitte referred to as a filmmaker, because I know her as a visionary theatre director of many years standing, yeah, who has directed true. a couple of films. <laughs> um, and isn't it fantastic, you know, that she has and that she can make that transition. And I think, you know, over the years, um, you know, people, actors have used, in particular, have used film and TV um, and voiceovers as well, actually, to subsidise their theatre work because theatre work is inevitably maybe paid. Although, interestingly, actually, um, marginally better paid, you know, at a reasonably subsidised level here than it is in the UK in terms of, you know, sort of theatres of, you know, subsidised theatres in London or, or in the regions, for example. Um, uh, and beyond that, um, you know, on the one hand, you've got, you know, a situation where you've got somebody like, you know, Paul Mescal, for example, who is a brilliant young actor who trained in Berlin. Um, a couple of years out, you know, did uh, play fantastic leading roles, including, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about asking for it, 
um, which he, he played in last year, which is coming back to the Gaiety in October, uh, and is now playing the lead in Normal People, which has made our life a misery, because he's, no <laughs> he's no longer available. So anyway, but I'm thrilled for him, and I actually bumped into him the other day, and he said he's having an amazing time, and he's, it's, it's going brilliantly, and it's a fantastic thing for his career. So of course we want people to be able to, it's, it's one way that they can actually sustain a career in this country, um, provided they do stay in this country. Um, uh, so I think, but I suppose the thing is, you know, you've got an, a young actor who, 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 you know, trained, trained here in the various part of Trinity, you know, learned his craft, you know, on stage in the theatre, and there is no, um, I suppose, investment or support from the film sector or acknowledgement, I suppose, of, of, you know, the path to, the path to film and television and theatre, uh, from there, theatre to there. And then that's sometimes <coughs> exacerbated by being a one-way motion. So if somebody works in theatre, gets very successful, like Killian Murphy, unless he's got a good relationship with the likes of Anne Clark, it's very rare that you will see these talented actors on stages because uh, film and television work is all-consuming and lucrative. Um, but I suppose the thing about it is there are also some actors who act a lot and really don't have any film or television careers at all. And it's not because they're not good. Maybe it's in a way because um, it hasn't been suggested or they haven't been encouraged. To, because there are, there are a different set of skills, as you know. I mean, theatre acting and, and screen acting are, are quite different disciplines. But it's more it, it, to encourage people to suggest them that it's a possibility and to keep the door open when um, all of our... I mean, we've just been trying to cast something. And you do the usual, and somebody was in Vikings, somebody who was in Dairy Girls, and they're all busy doing more film projects and more TV projects. Um, so it would be great to, to have a way to lure them back. In terms of tax regimes, I, I don't know how actors generally constitute themselves for tax. What was welcome was a recent decision by the Department of Social Protection to recognise the fact that um, working in culture is precarious mm -hmm. and to allow people to be seeking work and not to be put under pressure to do things that are not germane to trying to develop their career. But I think the main way to do it is for there to be more opportunities, simply more employment means more opportunities and more employment comes from more money and more infrastructure. Thanks, and we, we might get back to that because this is one of the things we did look at uh, in the research, but we have some interesting comments maybe on that mobility question. Yes, over here, uh, oh, on the sorry. right, sorry. No, no, go, go. Yeah. Um, can I make a statement for this question? Um, just I'd like to introduce you. Uh, sorry, I'm Fran Keefe, or Byrne, depending on which county you know me from, uh, from Screen Skills Ireland. So, as a former freelancer, uh, currently working Screen Skills Ireland, having been the, screen, the short films executive for the film board for about 12 years, so I've many hats on, and I also taught in the Houston in NUIG. So, one of my statements just with regard to the Screen Skills Development Plans, which is part of the Section 481 funding, is that we are addressing diversity and gender and sustainability along with training. And one of the reasons is because we want it to be across the board, because a lot of training is for above the line, there's a lot of directors, courses, mm -hmm. writers, but not necessarily um, skills development for people going through the ranks. So with regard to you know gender and diversity and training, we are trying to spread that right across from training right up to above the line, which would be writer, producer, director. Um, and my question is, having come from all those different backgrounds and not going to Trinity, um, I came through a very you know, you know, odd route, I would call it an apprenticeship more than anything else. And what we're finding now, and I found when I was teaching, is that we get four grades coming out of all the different film schools, producers, directors, DOPs and editors. Nobody wants to be anything else. Mm -hmm. And I just, and say from Ed's point of view, seeing people coming in, I say you see a, a lot more of those people coming knocking on your door than crew. And the film schools are, are not really addressing the wider um, kind of element of the hundreds of people. And I used to say to my students, have a look at the credit list and see how many are directors, mm -hmm. see how many producers. Look at all the hundreds of people that are on that list. So I just wonder, are the schools addressing the training requirements for the industry? And I suppose I'm talking about film more than theatre. It's a bit of a bugbear, man. I agree with you. I mean, I think we have a lot of third level courses for film and television in this country, but they all feel very siloed and they feel very siloed from the industry itself. So we rarely, you know, I mean, obviously this is a welcome exception, but we rarely have contact with the third level courses, uh, uh, colleges, to ask 
questions like that, you know, how you encourage other skills. Um, and there are, you know, there are kind of crashing shortages in the film industry, you know, and, and um, many, many opportunities. Um, but I, 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 you know, I don't know what it requires, but it, it sort of, you know, feels like there needs to be some kind of um, coordinating of the different courses that are offered and maybe a concentration of them so that they're of a higher quality. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, it's a bit of a mess. But I just followed up with it's just a point that Anne made that she wished she had an opportunity to be on set to see, sorry, um, to learn before you have to step into the role. And I think maybe the colleges could be encouraging people to take on other roles so they can learn to be great directors or producers. And maybe they'll stay as crew, <coughs> but to encourage that on set learning that you were just talking about, Anne. Thanks. Bundles of questions. Maybe Jeff at the front of you. Um, sorry. Jake, could you please remember Jake? Yeah. Um, can I just introduce uh, Professor Jeff Prosick, who helped us enormously put together this, uh, put together the funding proposal, and has been giving us advice on, on the project. Thank you. That's kind of you. Um, and I'm glad you came around with the with the mic, because um, one of the things I've suddenly over the last couple of years found myself doing at events when people say, "Oh, I don't need a mic," um, <laughs> is pointing out that. Um, hearing problems are a hidden disability. Um, I've got hearing problems, but there will probably be some people in the room who have. Um, and the people who say, oh, I've got a loud voice, I don't need a mic, are actually condemning those people for not hearing what's said. So I found myself in the event of Singapore last week stopping somebody who said they didn't need a mic. And, and I felt terrible about having done it, but it just seemed to Anyway, thank you for the mic. Can you walk in? Yes. Um, I, I wanted to. Um, the, the, the issue of film schools is one that hadn't come up much before until, until just then. Um, I've, a couple of years ago, I joined the board of the National Film and Television School um, in Beaconsfield in, 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 in England, um, <clears throat> solely a postgraduate, one of the great film schools in the world. And they were faced with the problem of diversity, um, which was actually increasing rather than decreasing because of who, the, who can afford to go on to a postgraduate study in film. Um, but they actively work very hard to diversify intake, with remarkable success. Within within a couple of years, there's been a tremendous increase in people from ethnically um, British ethnically diverse backgrounds, not the overseas students. This is this is British students, um, which has led to a really encouraging next step. She's the students, um, students of all ethnicities, um, including white British, are demanding that the visiting tutors, who are the key exposure to the industry should actually be much more diverse. Mm -hmm. And they now set quotas for that, and it's dead easy. Once you tell people on the staff, um, you have got to have 25%, and the aim is actually to get 50%, so it's really positive, people from ethnically diverse backgrounds um, as visiting tutors, directors and, 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 and um, um, post-production um, technical people and so on coming in, it's very easy to find them. Um, and suddenly that changes the whole atmosphere um, in, in, in the institution. But being on an NFTS board does raise a an issue for me which um, will turn into my question of this, and that is, <clears throat> I'm, I'm struck as somebody who looks at the creative industries from the outside, at how incredibly platform, how <clears throat> incredibly traditional we are in the way we think of platform, of the platform. So I can see that theatre and film have a good deal that is, is different, clearly, because the platform is different. One is, one is live, the other one is, 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 is recorded for screen. Um, but we keep thinking about film and TV and games, um, all screen-based, all with using a lot of similar techniques, um, as if they're separate platforms. Um, one thing that I discovered when I, when I, when I joined NFTS board um, was that the people on the table were almost entirely industry people. I was one of the only HE people there. Industry people were saying to me, TV is where it's all happening. That's where the exciting stuff is going on in screen production of drama. Um, I don't know whether that, you know, that, 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 that platform dis Set of platform distinctions are archaic in general terms, whether they're archaic in Ireland. I mean, to be honest, we, I mean, we, we're not involved in games, so I can't really speak to that. But as between film and television, I think it is quite platform agnostic. I mean, as in most of the people who work in the film industry work in the television mm -hmm. industry. They, the crews go between the two all the time, particularly here in Ireland, and less so in the UK, but all the time. And, and actually what we do is, as a company, is that we're, we're in scripted 
entertainment, if you like. It's all about scripts. So the script could be for a short form, one half hour thing, which is a movie or a TV movie, or a longer, longer series. So it, it's for why we do both, because actually there isn't, I mean, we do refer to one as TV. I think that suggests long form and film, which suggests a one-off short form thing. But beyond that, it's pretty platform agnostic, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, we've got time for just to quickly say that, oh, that theatre is more accommodating of different forms, mm -hmm. although the more different it is, the more expensive it is generally, the fewer people can see it. To me, um, TV, serial drama that's released all at the same time is almost like a form of scrolling like we do on our phones. Mm -hmm. um, there are different grammars between TV and, and film, but there's, there hasn't been much experimentation, I don't know, since like, you know, uh, W.D. Griffith or whatever. I mean, the grammar was established pretty early on, and it's more or less true to that ever since. I think Sylvia, yeah, where Jake is. Hi, yeah, and Bert Chanter from the Directors Guild. Just to say, from the director's point of view, one of the most outstandingly successful um, developments in terms of gender has been Red Rock, and something which uh, is mm -hmm. produced. And to see directors like Norway go on from you know, you know, but relatively modest experience to work on EastEnders, and you've got Hannah Quinn who's now directing a HBO series, and just giving directors a chance, particularly a documentary to now, on, and Laura's coming back for Blood. It's just been an amazing um, development in terms of men mentorship. So, I'm wondering, Ed, could you talk a little bit about mentorship and, and your experience as a producer on mentoring talent? Um, I mean, in relation to that, like it's, it's, it's partly that kind of nudge thing, you know, that when someone says you should have more female directors, then you go about finding more female directors. And, and that sounds trite and, um, and it doesn't particularly um, complement us as an industry, but, but as soon as that was raised, I think people were really responsive to it. Uh, and in terms of the mentoring thing on something like Red Rock, I mean, to be honest, there's a, there's a, a bit of like a sink or swim. It's a really tough schedule, and um, uh, and you kind of you know you, you have to sort of shoot an episode in two days. So it's incredibly tough, mm -hmm. and and actually people who are good really really sort of um, thrive. And then there's a big sort of producer group around them to help them and to sort of advise them. And, and actually, in our case, an, an absolutely brilliant DOP, a guy called Kieran Tannen, who shot almost the entire series and who was so decent to every new director, male, female, whatever, who came on in terms of helping them find their way through it. I guess more than anything, he was the mentor, to be fair, Kieran. Um, well, moving straight on to the second time to uh, Gia Moody. First of all, we found about three fantastic speakers. Um,